Uh, so you're going to talk about the use of remote sensing technology for phenotyping and tree improvement programs in British Columbia. And I believe you're faculty, faculty at UBC and a PhD candidate. Yeah, that's correct. Um, yeah, so uh, I'm part of the Integrated Remote Sensing Studio uh, here at UBC. We're part of the Faculty of Forestry. And this work um, I did with a lab mate of mine, Samuel Grubinger, as well as Nicholas Koops, our supervisor. And yeah, so I'll just be talking about the use of remote sensing and specifically airborne laser scanning uh, for phenotyping in tree improvement programs in BC. So uh, first I'll just talk a bit about what tree improvement looks like, what are the current methods and limitations. Then I'll talk about um, what role airborne laser scanning can play. And we'll look at a case study that we did with some coastal luckless fur improvement trials, the work that we're currently doing, and kind of what the future outlook is for this technology in tree improvement. So programs, tree improvement programs are designed to develop genetically improved trees to increase the economic value of the forest. And to do so, we define a, po a base population and select the best trees from that population to be propagated. And this is a cycle that can be repeated multiple times um, over time to increase and maximize the gains that we're getting from the trees. Uh, trees are selected by taking measurements of observable characteristics, uh, also known as phenotyping. And then they're tested in a variety of different settings in order to confirm that the gains that we predict are real, which is a very important step. Um, tree improvement currently is successful, but there are several limitations, such as it being quite labor intensive. You have to send people into the forest. It's expensive because you have to hire multiple people. It takes a long time to measure every single tree. And once crown closure has occurred in these stands, it's also quite difficult to accurately measure the large trees. Besides that, uh, because they're focusing on increased yield, they only take a couple of measurements per tree. Uh, and they're very, very basic measurements. It'll just be height and DBH, which means that we don't really know whether these trees are structurally or functionally different from one another. Airborne laser scanning, also known as LIDAR, can help address this challenge um, because we now have improved technologies. In the past, um, this technology focused on more on area-based assessments of the forest. But because we have these increased point densities, storage has improved, costs have decreased, and we're more flexible in that we can put these sensors on different vehicles. Um, it's changed the way that we can look at the forest. We're now able to phenotype individual trees and provide proxies for the traditional measurements. So if we look at that figure on the right hand side, we can get crown height, tree height, and diameter, which is something that the traditionalists want us to collect, but we can also provide more than that. Uh, we can derive metrics that can be measured to describe key structural differences between the trees in improvement trials. So this means that we can look at things like tree volume or how points are distributed through the tree crown and see how they're different. This leads us to our case study on coastal spur. Um, we collected data for two types of genetics trials at five different sites and tested a variety of approaches. We wanted to look at the crown variation, um, or sorry, variation in crown structure between trees at the individual tree scale and at the branch scale, as well as comparing volume estimates from LIDAR with field measure data at the plot level using the area-based approach. As we can see here on the map, our study sites were spread across the seed planting zone in southwestern BC, from Cowichan Lake in the south to north of Campbell River on Vancouver Island. This is an example of a realized gains trial. Um, this is where we simulate growing conditions of operational plantations by planting trees of similar genetic worth in blocks. And these tests help us to quantify the gains in harvest yield. At these tests, um, wild stand, as you can see in the red, represents the control. So they're an unimproved tree seed source. 
the mid gain represents 10% gain, while the top cross represents 18% gain. And in this case, gain is defined as the volume gain for the tree at rotation age. So top cross are supposed to be the best trees. Uh, for our data acquisition, we acquired two LiDAR data sets. The first was collected using a UAV with a Viladine puck mounted to a DJI Matrice. Um, we flew it at approximately 50 meters above the ground and had a point density of approximately 650 points per meter squared with two returns per pulse. And so here you can see what the UAV looks like. Um, it's pretty similar to what was shown in the opening presentation for the day. And then this is what it looks like um, from above. So you can see it's pretty, pretty dense. It's pretty easy to pick up um, the rows and the columns here. The second data set was collected using a contractor who flew the unit on an airplane. It is a Teledyne Optech uh, sensor. And this one had 200 points per square meter with up to seven pulses, uh, seven returns per pulse. And you can see it here as well. When we look at them in cross section, you can see the UAV data is more dense and it gave us a lot of information through the crown. While the Teledyne data, it's a little bit more attenuated, but we do still get quite a good ground and we get uh, information throughout the whole crown as well. So, once we've acquired the data, the workflow for us being able to do uh, an individual tree analysis is largely the same. First, we need to collect the data, pre-process it before it gets segmented um, for our analysis. The pre-processing generally follows the same routine. Um, first, you have to classify the point cloud, then you have to remove the noise, normalize the point cloud so that we can detect trees correctly and eventually segment them. There are challenges associated with these steps um, as you have quite a lot of control as a user. So when you're trying to identify noise and the ground, you have to take into account how dense is your LIDAR? You know, what kind of forest are you in? Are you in a deciduous forest where you might have a different tree shape, for example? And the same thing goes for when we're uh, trying to detect our treetops we have to be willing to experiment with different parameters in order to find what best fits the forest that we're working with. Um, finally, when we look at our segmentation routine, there are point-based routines which operate on the raw point cloud, and there's uh, segmentation routines that operate on rasters. In our case, we found that it was actually easier to use a CHM to segment our trees as our things, our trials were planted in rows and columns. So it was much easier to separate out. So once we have done all this, this is the result. Um, this is a point cloud that's been denoised, normalized, segmented, and we've clipped it to the appropriate plot. Um, so it's at this point that we can start to produce metrics that describe and summarize each tree. So for this study, we broadly took three approaches. The first was to summarize the whole tree. We created metrics that describe the vertical distribution of the point cloud. Um, we looked at the volume that was occupied by the trees. We created functions to describe the tree using just a couple of parameters known as the Weibull probability density function. And we also looked at voxel metrics. Um, this is where you create boxes of a certain dimension that you decide and you can look at whether the spaces are empty or filled. And on the right-hand side, we can see an example of volumes uh, occupied by trees and how if we vary one of the parameters, we get different looking trees. And so we can also experiment with, within these parameters at how the different trees look. So what we found is that trees with different genetic levels were different from one another. Um, in an example here, this is the Weibull probability density function. We can see density of the points on the x-axis and normalized heights between zero and one on the y. And you can see how the curves differ for top cross trees and wild stand trees at different spacings. And specifically here, you can see how different top cross trees at a 2.3 meter spacing are different from the wild stand trees. What we found as well in general was that top cross trees are typically taller with higher and shorter and denser crowns 
but that the interaction between spacing and genetic level was an important step to take into account. Uh, the next approach um, that we took was to look at individual branches. We aimed to characterize branches in the upper third of the crown and describe their length, width, angle, and volume. And on the right-hand side, you can kind of see an example of that where the different branches are colored differently. To do this, uh, we used a point clustering approach. We first created 50 clusters in the tree before iteratively merging them to produce branches. From there, we could produce metrics for length, width, and angle using a principal component analysis. So we took the individual cluster, which represented a branch, and we performed a PCA. Uh, principal component one was representative of the length, while PC2 could represent the width. And from that, we could also get the angle. And we could also create some volume-related metrics similar to what we did for the whole tree, except just focusing on a single branch. Um, as you can see here, we did have a filtering step. Um, all of these algorithms are agnostic um, in that they don't know what's a branch and what's not a branch. So we did have to be careful about incorrectly segmented branches that were either over-segmented or under-segmented. And so this filtering step really was user-driven, um, but I think that it was important to get the best representation of the branches. So this is some of the results. We found that trees with different genetic levels were different from one another. Um, we also found that the top cross trees at four meter spacing were consistently significantly different whenever genetic level or the interaction effect between genetic level and spacing was significant. Uh, as we can see here on the, on the two left-hand side, sorry, the left-hand side in the middle graph, this is length. Um, we could split this up to look at specifically just the genetic level and just the spacing. We could see that there's differences, but other metrics that we produced, like width, that interaction between the two spacings and the three genetic levels was significant. So we could only look at our results in, in context, so to speak. So you can see here that four meter top cross tree is still significantly different. The third approach that we took um, is that we looked at these realized gain sites using an area-based approach to see how well we could predict that ground measured gain. As we can see from the figure, our gain predictions, um, which is on the x-axis, is generally very good. Um, and our model uses metrics that represent the realized gain for leaf area index and mean canopy height to predict the volume. Um, so you can see even in the full data set, this is a pretty robust model. Uh, currently, we're working on applications to a different set of genetic trials um, with the aim of improving tree breeding and breeding value estimation. Um, these trials are significantly older, so we are also looking at how these techniques that we're using in um, younger trials. So the first set of trials were planted in 1996, whereas these trials were planted in 1997. Does this method that we're using carry across? Um, and do we have to, what do we have to change uh, between the trials? We're also looking at incorporating um, digital aerial photogrammetry to look at the foliage spectral reflectance, as this could be a predictor of growth and productivity. And we're also interested in the seasonal dynamics related to adaptation in interior spruce. So we're applying this um, whole workflow to a different tree species as well. So here we can see an example of three different point clouds from the work that I just mentioned. Um, we have one taken with a UAV, um, just a regular camera on a DJI. We have a multi-spectral camera and LiDAR from left to right. The drone obviously gives us the RGB, which is good for just basic indices and also kind of situating ourselves in the point cloud. The multi-spectral one uh, is useful to derive indices like NDRE or normalized difference red edge, um, as this index is sensitive to chlorophyll content in leaves and could help us see the nuanced differences between the trials. And we can also um, incorporate it, still incorporate LiDAR into this. And just as a note, if we look at these in cross section, we can see how different um, these data sets actually are. Um, so the strengths of the 
DAP is that we really get uh, spectral values on the outside of the crown, but LIDAR is still very, very important to get that internal structure. And finally, the outlook for integrating remotely sensed data into these tree improvement programs looks extremely bright. Um, data is becoming more accessible in that it's becoming cheaper and easier to collect, while processing is getting simpler all the time. Companies are creating tools to improve the workflow from raw data to the finished product, while free and open forestry-specific packages are becoming, uh, becoming available. So an example of this is the LiDAR package, which is available in R, but there's also packages in MATLAB that are becoming available and Python. Um, finally, I think it's important to note as well, we're now at a point where we have enough experience with different technologies that we're able to focus on the strength of the technology. And that gives us the ability to pick the right tool for the job and to maximize the information that we derive from a single data acquisition. Um, so Samuel and I, uh, we've published some, a couple of papers on the work that we're doing, um, and we're hoping to publish a few more before, before we finish our studies. And with that, I'd just like to say thank you for listening. And yeah, none of this would be uh, possible without our funding partners. So thanks to them as well. Thank you. Thanks for your time and your presentation. Uh, any questions? I don't see any right now, but we'll wait a few seconds for the, there's a little delay between the broadcasts and the stream. Well, that was very insightful. What can NDRE tell us versus NDVI in forestry? So my understanding is that NDVI is uh, better in conifers and it's just a bit more subtle um, in the differences that it can show us um, with regards to how that index interacts with the chlorophyll um, in the needles. So that's kind of what the reason why we're using it, we have a microsense sensor in the lab that we've been using. And so it also gives us that ability to gather um, more information, I guess, yeah, it's maybe more information than we need initially, but we found that it is quite useful. And in these trials where it's, it's the same tree species, so we're really looking for subtle differences and that's kind of the, where that's coming to the fore at the moment. Fiona from ABMI is amazed by your work. 650 points per meter. That is impressive for sure. Yeah, so we flew that sensor. I think um, we probably had about four or five flight lines that, were, that had heavy overlap. So that's how we managed to collect that data. Uh, and our limitation was really the battery capacity in that we could only fly for so many minutes. And so it's kind of how we maximize our point density versus how much time do we have in the air? Because we did five sites in five days. So that was really that, that limiting factor. <laughs>